What's up guys, Evil Deer here, and today I wanted to present another historical aspect of the Esperanto community. I want to talk about the French campaign against Esperanto at the League of Nations. Now, I've decided to do another one of these videos where I look at some historical aspect simply because I enjoy doing them, I enjoy talking about these topics, and it appears to me that you guys enjoy watching these videos because they've actually got a fair few views compared to my normal vlogs. Anyway, I will do more vlogs in the future, but I'm probably going to do a lot more of these because I just enjoy doing them. Before I go into this, I just want to say that I got a lot of this information from this book, La Dangera Lingvo, which speaks about this and also other events during the Esperanto history, but you can actually find this information outside of this book in particular. I think also this book's in English if you don't speak Esperanto. You can find this information in Wikipedia and in other pages, even in like official records from the League of Nations, but you would have to kind of put it together yourself. So if you just wanted to get like something that just looked at this one aspect, Watch this video or get this book. Highly recommend it. So I guess first up, before I go into what happened, I've got to give you like a little rundown of what the League of Nations is. So the League of Nations was like the precursor of the United Nations. It was founded on the 10th of January 1920 and it basically dissolved, dissolved after World War II. So the League of Nations existed during World War II, but during World War II it basically just it was like the shell of an organization that had really no power and basically did nothing, but it's still like like legally existed. Now the mission of the League of Nations was basically world peace. It was created after World War One, and it was basically created to stop any more future wars. So obviously it was not very successful in that regard. Interesting little fact note about this, uh, the United States, although they signed on to the League of Nations, like they signed the original declaration for it, they never actually joined the League of Nations. And the Soviet Union also didn't really join the Le League of Nations except for like a very short period of time, which is basically why the League of Nations failed in essence, because two of the greatest like powers of the day weren't part of the League of Nations. Now the working languages of the League of Nations was French and English, and this is important for later. So I just wanted to show you what a map of uh, like the member states of the League of Nations was in 1920. As you can see here, there's actually a fair few uh, East Asian countries that were part of the League of Nations. Uh, and you'll notice that Germany's not there. And if we continue down to 1945, which is around about the time that it actually dissolved, you can see that a whole heap of members had dropped out of the League of Nations. So that's it previously, that's it like at the end. We're gonna go into the Esperanto aspect of the League of Nations. Remember that I stated that the goal of the League of Nations was world peace. So this was straight after World War One. there was a lot of idealism about let's not do the mistakes of a parents type of thing. In comes this guy, Edmund Privet. I think that's how you pronounce it, if not, sorry guys. Anyway, he was an Esperanto speaker, historian, university professor, author, journalist, and peace activist. And he was actually, uh, for a period of time, a member of, for quite a long time, he was a, uh, I think it was, I think it was like a board member or something of the Universal Esperanto Association. Someone's gonna correct me in the comments. By the way, I just wanna state now, although these videos have a lot of information, you actually find even more information in the comments. People love to add just extra little bits of information. So an interesting thing was, he was actually an interpreter at the League of Nations for a period of time, and he became a vice delegate of Iran at the League of Nations. I don't know why, I couldn't find out why, because he was a Swiss Esperanto speaker. So there's probably like a really interesting story behind that. So we'll hopefully find out through the comments. But he also became the chief editor of the main magazine for the Universal Esperanto Association, Esperanto, that's the name of the magazine. So this is our main guy. This is the guy who basically started the whole thing of Esperanto at the League of Nations. In December 1920, he managed to get 11 delegates together from Belgium, Brazil, Czechoslovakia, Chile, China. You can see the list there on the screen. And he convinced them to put forward a resolution basically uh, proposing Esperanto at the League of Nations. And this was during the first assembly of the League of Nations. This is the full resolution that was put forward. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. You can pause the video and look at it, but I'm gonna point out basically the main parts of it. The resolution was saying or proposing that they start the official teaching of the international language Esperanto in public schools of some members of the League. It wasn't like all members, it was some members. And the idea was we'll get it going in some states. If it goes well, then as you can see in the second part, they wanted that everyone would have their mother tongue and then also Esperanto 
Esperanto as like a tool of communication. So that's the full thing, that was the full proposal that was put forward. When they put this proposal forward, remember these were the delegates here, you can see them, there was no French delegate in there. So he'd spoken to a heap of delegates, got them on board, and then put this proposal, this resolution forward. So the resolution was put forward at the second commission on the 18th of December 1920, and for some reason I've written the word second commission there twice. The French delegate, I'm not going to try to pronounce his surname, Gabriel, uh, was a member of the French Academy. So the French Academy was basic, or is, it's kind of like um, the Academy of Esperanto. The goal is to try and push the evolution of Esperanto in certain ways, etc. He had this thought process because you can see through the other books that he written that he was worried that French was losing its prestigious position as the international language of diplomacy. Anyway, at this time, French and English were basically, you know, equal in this uh, position. And as soon as this proposal was put forward, he basically stood up and demanded that the proposal not be discussed, and he was very loud about it. And the president of the commission basically went, oh, uh, okay, and he just basically put down his stamp and said, let's skip this, let's not discuss it. This annoyed the other delegates, they were quite angry about this, but French or the of the French government were quite powerful, so they didn't want to really, like, get into a full-on argument with the French. In fact, it was so annoying for some of the delegates, such as the Japanese delegates, that it was, like, all through the newspapers in Japan. Now, this is kind of what he said, and I put it in red here, and it's in Esperanto because I can't find the original French, and even if I could, I couldn't read it anyway. So, I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to give you an English translation of the Esperanto I found. Now, remember, this might be, like, a propagandized version of it. It might not be exactly what he said. So he said that the, uh, the French language has its history, its beauty, and it's used by the greatest writers who are known in the entire world. And it's also like the admired um, tool of spreading ideas around the world. So he was basically saying, you know, French is the language of the elite. It's the language that people use. If you want to spread ideas, we're going to use French. It's not going to be Esperanto. Privet, or Privat, this dude, Privat, <laughs> He basically was not expecting this. He kind of went into this like really idealistic. He got a whole heap of nation states on board and he was like, wow, you know, going so well. And then the French just came and like steamrolled him. What happened after this is that um, Maurice, who was actually a Esperanto speaker for the Society of the um, Promotion of Esperanto, wrote to Privet in December 1920 and he said, this is what he said. I'm surprised that you were kind of like shocked about the um, unfriendliness because we have for some time received quite a uh, unfriendly favorable welcome from Quai de Orsay, uh, which is basically the a reference to where the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs was located. So basically, the French uh, president of the Esperanto Promotion Society, whatever, wrote to him and said, look, I'm not surprised because, you know, for quite some time, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs has not given us any favor. So you shouldn't have been, like, expecting them to be in any way favorable to your proposal. Anyway, he did not give up the second attempt. So he proposed it again. This time he organized that the League of Nations would actually send a delegate, an official delegate, to go to an Esperanto Congress and see what actually happens at the Esperanto Congress. So they sent uh, Nitobi Inazo, and you can see that he's a Japanese delegate. Um, he was not an Esperanto speaker, he wasn't in any way related to Esperanto, and he went to the 13th World Congress of Esperanto in Prague as the official delegate of the League of Nations. And this was like the first objective report of Esperanto by a high-ranking official at the time. He actually, when he went there, like spoke with people, saw the actual event in progress, and decided quite favorably that, you know, Esperanto is quite a good thing. This is what he said in Esperanto. I can't find the original, if it was French, if it was Japanese, whatever. So if someone can actually find the original, post in the comments, that would be great. But what he said is that um, during, oh, uh, sorry, I'm going to try to translate this to English. While the rich and the well-educated enjoy the literature and scientific works in their original form, the poor and the people, you know, who aren't as well off, they utilize Esperanto as like a international language for the um, exchange of ideas. So because of this, Esperanto is kind of like a motor of international democracy and it's a really a good tool for linking people together. So he said it's necessary to take a consideration of interest from 
um, the masses in the rational and favorable like spirit. Basically what he was saying is like, you know, although the rich can enjoy languages, uh, enjoy literature and science and all that type of stuff in their original language, the poor have kind of taken it upon themselves to look at Esperanto. So he's looking at this quite favorably. So obviously he brought this back and the Second Assembly in September 1921 formed and 11 delegates again proposed Esperanto. And the proposal was accepted this time. Um, I don't know why the French didn't veto it, maybe they weren't even there at the time. But at that point, the French weren't happy. So they started a campaign and in January 1922, the General Secretary started asking state members to provide an update on the instruction of Esperanto in their schools or what they're doing because he was going to put together a proper proposal and send this out. So the original proposal that was accepted uh, wasn't kind of like the finalized proposal. So the French government instantly started a campaign against Esperanto. French officials were barred officially from going to any Esperanto event or even engaging in an event where an Esperanto was in any form used and Privet himself was barred from entering France in 1921. Apparently there was a lot of other things done but I couldn't find any proof of those things. For instance uh, this book states that the French government even started funding um, Edo which was another created language kind of to counteract Esperanto but I couldn't find anything about that external to Esperanto sources so I didn't want to include it. But there was other things that was mentioned but these are kind of like the only things that I could find official references to. And on the 3rd of June 1922, Léon, who was the Minister of Public Instruction, instructed all French schools to no longer provide any information on Esperanto or about Esperanto. So basically they officially denied Esperanto's use in France uh, within schools. Now I don't know if they went to the extent of like denying associations or anything but they went to the extent of denying its instruction at schools. So this is what he said, again it's an Esperanto, can't find the French even if I could, couldn't speak it. So you can copy that in the comments if you can. The French language will be for always the language of civilization and at the same time the best tool for the dissemination of literature which is not comparable to anything else. And it also is like in following it serves to the expansion of the French thinking. So you can see this is quite a colonist uh, thought process. He's saying yeah, French is always going to be the international language and no other language can even compare to its literature and it also helps in the expansion of French, our thought processes. Um, in this modern age if a politician said that they'd probably get like smashed on social media. He protested to the League of Nations stating that Esperanto speakers <laughs> were actually presenting a negative opinion of French. Now, I could probably imagine that some Esperanto speakers were not happy with French speakers at that stage, probably because they felt, you know, that they were being attacked by the French, and maybe there was actually some of this going on, who knows, but it's just kind of funny and ironic. Anyway, after this, on August of tw uh, 1922, the French delegate, Georges, or I don't know how to pronounce his name, stated that he had received a directive from his government to veto any attempt to introduce a world language other than French. So at this stage, the French government's now putting vetoes in place to stop Esperanto. And it's kind of funny, I did not know about this before until I started my research, but the Brazilian delegate, Raul, actually condemned Esperanto during the meeting in a really long speech, stating that Esperanto is a language of the poor and of the communists, with no tradition, no literature, and without intellectual value. So he was basically stating that because the intellects didn't like Esperanto, and the poor liked Esperanto, well then Esperanto's of no use. Funnily enough, I didn't expect this, but a British lawmaker, Lord Robert Cecil, uh, rebutted, stating that people needed to remember that a world language was needed by everyone, not just the intellects. So it was kind of cool to see that, like, the British stepped up here. Now, the question of Esperanto was causing so much chaos within the uh, League of Nations that they were basically just handballing it to different departments, different commissions, different communities. So it was just passed around. Eventually, it ended up at the International Committee of Intellectual Cooperation, and are constantly vetoed by the French. Now, finally, enough if you look at you got to read this book but if you look at each person who vetoed it or voted against it they stated different reasons at the league for why they were against it maybe they said they they thought the uh, Esperanto had no merits had no literature but if you look at their private correspondence or what they um, even said in their own books later on about Esperanto or just publicly stated elsewhere most of the time their biggest fear was not that Esperanto would supplant French their biggest fear was providing an international language that the poor could use to communicate across international boundaries. So I thought that was quite fascinating. I thought it was mainly because French were worried that Esperanto would replace it, but they were more worried different countries would be able to speak to each other, the poor of different countries. 
So basically, after that, uh, in September 1923, the commission just decided, look, we're no longer going to look into this matter of an international language. Nitobi, the Japanese guy who was sent to actually to the 13th World Esperanto Congress, his response to this whole situation was the League lacked wisdom. Now, the French weren't finished. Although they managed to veto Esperanto and stop discussion on the matter, they wanted to take it further. They actually put a proposal Esperanto and any other artificial language or created language should not be recommended as a tool for teaching in any school or any state. So they wanted to completely bar Esperanto everywhere. Funnily enough, the member states finally pushed back against the French and said, although they didn't want to support the proposal because, you know, the French didn't like it, uh, that Esperanto be taught, they also didn't want to bar Esperanto from being taught. Now, there was one short-lived victory at the same time while the French were like videoing Esperanto over here. Uh, the Fifth Assembly actually recommended that Esperanto be used for the language of telegraphy, which is interesting and also not really that important because, as we all know, the telegraph basically died. Now, at this point, that was basically the end of the story of Esperanto at the League, but it was also kind of the end of the League itself because the League was losing power basically every year and it basically came down to everyone was just supporting what they wanted and they weren't actually trying to make anything that would support world peace and as you know and as history has proven World War II eventually happened the League became the shell of an organization World War II after World War II ended the League had one last meeting basically that meeting happened just to disband itself and to send the finances it had back to its different member states and then found the United Nations. So that's the end of the video. If you like this topic and if you've got any information on this or if you noticed if I made any mistakes, I'm not a professional historian, kind of like just amateur, uh, leave comments below. If you like this video, like it, share it around, sub to the channel, and I'll see you all in the next video. And if you're not there, well then I hope you're reading La Dungeon Lingvo.